Well, take your Bibles and turn to Psalm chapter 139. Psalm 139. When you think of the word greatness, I uh, think about how the world seeks to achieve greatness in uh, various venues of careers and whatnot. And most people strive for greatness on one, some level or another, either financial greatness, career greatness, uh, being great at a sport, or maybe you think of in history, you've got great uh, world leaders, political leaders, military leaders, uh, those who are known as having great financial success and business success include people like Steve Jobs, uh, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Henry Ford, John D. Rockefeller. You think of military and political leaders, great leaders. Uh, of course, we, you know, in our own country, you think of someone like uh, General Washington, President Washington. Uh, you've got Abraham Lincoln. If you go back to history before, you've got people like uh, 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 Genghis Khan leading the Mongols, Attila the Hun, and, and people like that. You, you've got the various emperors in Rome who are also often uh, great military leaders. You've got uh, great artists and sculptors like Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo will come to mind. When you think of, of sports, you've got people like uh, Joe Montana, Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, LeBron James, Michael Jordan. Uh, you think of Cristiano Ronaldo in soccer and Tiger Woods for golf. These are all people in discussion for uh, who is the greatest in their, pers uh, in their respective profession. And we, when we observe greatness, whether it be in, in a worldly profession or a sport or a military uh, or a political leader, it often invokes a response from us. And, you know, whenever, uh, maybe you've seen uh, the, the show um, Shark Tank, where various entrepreneurs can come in and, and present their um, uh, device or, or thing that they've created to sell to the market to, to meet some sort of need. And they tell these, these sharks, these millionaires, uh, they're trying to get them to invest in their product. And to help it grow even more, you know, they're, they're saying, you know, we've have this many units that we've sold this year for this amount of money. And sometimes the sharks, the millionaires just kind of laugh at them being like, this is a ridiculous product or you got your profits are like nothing. We're not going to invest in you. Or sometimes they're just like blown away. And because of, you know, this, uh, the, they have this response to this immediately, uh, this great success they're having. They want to invest in it. You know, if you, if you look at a marble statue or a painting and you can look at it and be like, wow, that is great. And you can just have verbal uh, uh, admiration for it. Or, uh, you know, maybe you like to, uh, like I do, watch top 10 plays, maybe on ESPN, or you've watched top 10 Super Bowl plays in history or in the NBA, and you're just wowed and thinking, how on earth did they do that? How did he make that diving catch? That, that, or or that, that game winning uh, three pointer? The defense was all over him. If you see a big dunk in basketball, oftentimes you see the people on all the bench. They're going like, oh, wow. And they're all just like wowed at the greatness they, that, that they just witnessed to. So greatness invo invokes a response to us when we see it. And that's natural. But when we think of the greatness of God, what kind of response does that invoke from you? And what kind of response do Christians have about to God's greatness in general? And far, far too often, Christians can become complacent and struggle with properly responding to the greatness of God. And we take it for granted. But today we're going to see from Psalm 139 that because of the greatness of God, you must worship Him. Now we're going to look at four truths about God. And the first one, the first truth, is that God knows everything. This has to do with his omniscience. We're going to look in the first six verses of, God, of Psalm 139. It says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. Thou, understand, thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. So looking in that first verse, uh, in reference to God's knowledge and how God knows everything, we first of all see that God's knowledge is personal. 
It's personal. There in verse 1, thou hast searched me and known me. That idea of searching is one of, of boring or digging or accurately or closely. Something that you're, you're searching specifically for, uh, uh, there's something in there. That, like you're looking for buried treasure and you're looking for it specifically in, de- in, in a very detailed way. And the result is that, in, in this case, is that nothing is or can be concealed from God. He is fully conscious of everything in our hearts. You know, there's nothing that we can hide from God. How many of you have ever done this with either your kids or somebody else's kids, or they've done this to you, more like it, is they close their eyes and they say, you can't see me. I mean, anybody ever done that? Yeah? Okay. And, and of course, because the little kid can't see you because they've closed their, they have their eyes closed, you can't see them. That's obviously how that works. Well, I think sometimes we think that we think we can hide hide things about ourselves from God or hide our actions, and that yet this verse reveals to us that He is fully conscious about everything about us. He has searched us and He knows us. That that word for known me that describes intimate, experiential knowledge. It's a very personal uh, term for knowledge. So God's knowledge is personal, but not only is it personal with us, each one of you, God knows each one of you because every one of us is important in God's sight. God's knowledge is detailed. Every minute action that we take is seen by God. We see this in the first part of verse 2 and then in verse 3, you know my, thou knowest my down sitting and my uprising. And then in verse 3, thou compassest my, my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. So when you go to bed... And when you get up, God sees that. When you sit down in a chair and you, and you stand up in, a, in, in about three hours when I'm done, no, um, in about 30 minutes when I'm done, God sees that. God knows that. Whenever it says in verse 3, thou compassest my path, that, that word has the idea of to comprehend or could be translated scrutinize. And it's the idea of to winnow out chaff, to, to scatter as the wind does to dust. So, so God, uh, David, the psalmist, Uh, speaking here, God has sifted him and scattered all that was valueless in order to make his path more valuable. God is taking into account everything that we do and is considering the value of our actions. And so every, every minute action that we take is seen by God. But not only that, every thought and word is said that is said is known by God before we even say it. Well, that's kind of scary. That God knows what we th- our thoughts before we even think them. He knows our words before we say them. We see this in the end of verse 2. Thou understandest standest my thought afar off. And then verse 4. For lo, there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, thou, o, thou, o Lord, uh, knowest it all together. I think of... Um, how, you know, some people can do this with their spouse. They've, they've been married for such a long time where, you know, you can fin- finish each other's sentences. How often does that really happen? Uh, you don't have to raise your hand. But uh, you, or, or you, more often than not, you think you know what the other person is going to say, and then you, you say, and then they're like, no, that's not what I was actually going to say. And you're like, oh, okay, uh, that, that's what happens to me when I try to do that and don't succeed. It's really funny because I have twin sisters. They're, they're about uh, uh, six years younger than I am. And we were talking about this over Christmas break, how they can just look at each other. They're identical twin sisters. They can just look at each other and just kind of be like, and they know, they know what each other is thinking. And, it, and it's really funny to watch. And, and whenever you're playing a game where it's like, well, we played a game that where you're kind of having to uh, depend on your partners, but you don't know, you can't like t- table talk or, or talk. You just kind of have to do table talk, and they can just kind of look at each other. And we're, okay. we're like, okay, you need to stop because you two have an unfair advantage with everybody, okay? They know each other. Well, God knows our words, our thoughts and our words even better than twins know each other's thoughts and words, before, even when they don't say it. And because God knows our thoughts and our words, he knows our hearts, our minds, he's going to hold us accountable. Matthew 12, 36 talks about how every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account of thereof in the day of judgment. So God, his God's knowledge of us is personal. It is detailed. But here's also in verse 5 and 6, we go into how God's knowledge is just unfathomable. 
As we see in verse 5, Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. God is everywhere around him and has enclosed him. That, that word beset means to press upon or compress. It's used for uh, besieging or to closely surround or confined and secure something. The, the idea is that there is no escape. I think of, uh, of the, the besieging army of General Santa Ana and at the Alamo in, in San Antonio, Texas. I've been there about three times now in my life. Uh, we actually went there on our honeymoon. And I got, got to see that. I went there as a kid, you know, had a, got a coonskin cap for Davy Crockett. And just how Santa Ana had surrounded the Alamo to where they, they, couldn't, they could barely even get somebody through to try to go get help. And help, help was not going to be able to come. And what happened? They took, because that army surrounded and besieged the Alamo and took it. And so that's the idea here of this word that, that God, does, his knowledge is just, David just can't fathom it. He's just everywhere around him. God is everywhere around him. And he breaks forth into verse 6. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's, it's so overwhelming to David. It's remarkable. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. I, I can't hope to understand it. I could never be like it. It's inaccessible. And we could never hope to even have this knowledge or understand it. Now, there are definitely people who are much smarter than I am they, and you know, have, have much uh, more advanced degrees than I do in, in science and whatnot, but God's knowledge is way past molecular biologists and physicists. The, the, the philosophers, they don't hold a candle to God's knowledge. So what's the response? As we, as we look up, as we think about these first six verses, how God knows everything, the response is that we must worship him. We must worship him with, with all of our life. So the, that leads us to the next truth in verses 7 through 12. Is the second truth is that God is everywhere. This speaks to his omnipresence. Now they say that um, t- moms and teachers have eyes in the back of their heads. Now, growing up, if I ever did something that was wrong or at least looked down upon and frowned upon, um, I, I was fearful that my mom would see me or she, I just knew she was going to walk around the corner and find me doing whatever I knew that I probably shouldn't be doing. And even if I got away with the deed that I had done, for the next several days, I was just kind of nervous to be around mom because I've, I felt like she knows, even though she hasn't said anything, she knows, you know. Well, moms and teachers, they're not everywhere. And even though they see more than kids think they see, uh, un- unlike moms and teachers, God actually is everywhere. We see this in verse, beginning in verse 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I se- ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins and hast covered me in my mother's womb. So as we go back to verses 7 8, we see that God is not limited by location. When it says, whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? Like, where can I go that God is not? Have you ever had one of those dreams where, I, I have them fairly often, and it's quite frustrating, but if you've ever had a dream like this where the bad guys are chasing you, and no matter how fast you run, or where you go, or even how many times you just beat this guy up and you run away, the guy always shows up. That, I, that's a frustrating dream that I have reoccurring. If you have that, I, you can, I can sympathize with you. If you don't, count yourself blessed. But uh, in, in reality, that's how God is. No, there's no place that we can go that God is not. And then in verse, uh, in verse 8, he says, If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Now that word hell there uh, is, is literally translated, uh, is literally Sheol. And it has the idea of not so much what we think of hell as far as the New Testament concept, but more so uh, a word referring to uh, the grave or the underworld or the netherworld, basically the place of the dead, as would have been the Old Testament understanding. 
But he's saying it doesn't matter. If I go as high up into the heavens, into the sky, or as low into the ground as the underworld, it doesn't matter. God is there. There is nowhere that God is not. And there's nowhere, and nowhere will his presence or his face not be. So therefore, he sees your actions. You cannot hide, as he says in verse 7. So there's no specific location that one can hide from God. So not only is God not limited by location, but God is also not limited by distance and speed. Going into verses 9 through 10, he talks about the wings of morning and dwelling in the uttermost parts of the sea. Now, what is the wings of morning or the wings of dawn? Uh, that, you know, different people will, will uh, uh, interpret this differently, uh, but the wings of the morning or dawn, is, something with wings is already fast, you know, typically. And, and the other thing about wings is that it's hard to track. You know, if somebody, if something is flying, how do you, how do you track something that's flying when it's not leaving something, uh, a track in the ground? So it could possibly re be referring to the morning, that is, the early light, the light is fast. Whenever, if you've ever been up in the early in the morning, when that sunlight first, you first see the sun coming up over the horizon and those first beams come over and you can look behind you and it's, it's actually you know, showing up on the hills or whatever behind you. As soon as that sun is up, it's boom, instantaneously. And so it's fast. But in the morning, when that day is breaking, and, and the light pierces into the darkness, it, 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 something else, excuse me, something else it, it would seem fast, but in, in that morning moment, when the sun comes up, that first dawn of light, it comes right across. It's instantaneously. And so God is not limited by, by the speed. David's saying, look, if I could go as fast as the light goes, uh, when it first comes over the horizon, look, God is still there. And if I go and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, God's there too. You know, thinking he would have been uh, thinking of the Mediterranean Sea. So he could be thinking also of as far as the east to the west, the sun coming up in the east and, and the Mediterranean, the sea in the west. It doesn't matter. This, it, it could be great distance. God is there. And so God is not limited by location or distance and speed. And, but not only that, God is also not limited by evil or even darkness. Now, as you think of darkness... Uh, many of you, uh, you don't have to raise your hand, but you would lift your hand uh, and raise it with mine that at one point or another, you were afraid of the dark. You know, uh, you know, and you don't have to tell me if you're still afraid of the dark. That's okay. Um, but why is the dark intimidating? You know, why is that? Just, just talk to me here for a minute. Because you can't see. That's right. Yeah, that, that's the most fundamental reason that we don't like the dark. Is, is because we can't see it. And, and even just this, this last week on uh, Friday, and then uh, coming back up here from North Carolina, and then when we went down, this happened too, is it wasn't dark because we traveled during the day, but there was a point when we were in the West Virginia mountains that it got really foggy, and they even had a sign up that said fog advisory. And we, you know, we ended up slowing down like 20 miles under the speed limit. And it wasn't dark, but it was so foggy that like, I, I couldn't see too much beyond me. And I, was, I put on my flashers, even put on my brights just so make sure everybody could see me. I was having a hard time seeing what was ahead. I didn't like driving in that. I'm glad that that was only for about 20 minutes because doing that for 10 plus hours would be very exhausting. You know, we, we like to be able to see things. And the psalmist here in verse 11 says, if I say surely the darkness shall cover me or overtake me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, and the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. So that, that word there in um, verse 11, cover, the darkness shall cover me. It's the idea of, of to bruise or crush or seize, or maybe as some would translate it as to overwhelm. So the darkness, darkness or evil may overtake a man. Man may even try to hide in the darkness. You know, we, we know that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. But the darkness cannot hide or cover or surprise God. God's light will prevail. And, and that's what he, he talks about in verse 12, how God sees in the both. It's not like uh, God has to have light. You know, 
we, a lot of people do wait until nighttime to do their evil deeds because you know, it's harder for other men to see what they've done wrong. You know, but it doesn't matter to God because he's got perfect night vision. And so that should be a comfort and a warning to us that we cannot hide our dark deeds from God, nor can the darkness or evil overtake us and go unseen by God. I love this song by Ron Hamilton that you're, you're very familiar with. We sing it here uh, a handful of times in the year. How, how can I fear? When shadows fall and the night covers all, and there are things that my eyes cannot see, I'll never fear, for the Savior is near. My Lord abides with me. Verse 2 says, When I'm alone and I face the unknown, and I fear what the future may be, I can depend on the strength of my friend. He walks along with me. How can I fear? Jesus is near. He ever watches over me. Worries all cease. He gives me peace. How can I fear with Jesus? So God knows who you are, as we've already discussed. He knows everything about you. And he is, his, his presence isn't limited by anything or, uh, here on this earth or anything that we can do. And so that should invoke a, another response from us. It should drive us to our obey him. That's our response. We must trust and obey. This is a comforting thing that God is every, everywhere and he sees everything. Because we know that there's nothing that we can go through here on earth and face, no trial, that God is not there helping you along the way. As, with, as we think of how 2020 uh, turned out, we thought it was going to be oh, such a cool, great year. And, and most people are like, eh, not so much. Um, God was in all that. And God knew what, what he, he had in store for 2020. He knows what's in store for 2021. And we can trust in him. But at the same time, it should also drive us to obey him. You know, just like when I was a kid and I thought I could get away with things because I, I thought my mom couldn't see me. And oftentimes, you know, she didn't because, uh, you know, nobody's everywhere uh, except for God. You know, I thought I could get away because no one was watching. And while no human was watching, God was watching. And so the fact that God sees everything and is everywhere should drive us to obey him. So question, you know, if, if your friends and your family knew and saw all the things that you did and all your thoughts that you have in private, would, would, if you knew that they saw those things, would that change how you lived you know, for some of you, for some of you, maybe you think, oh, yeah, it would actually change a lot. For some of you, that may mean, no, really, not much would change because I, I feel like, as best as I can, by God's grace, I'm living a life that I should. And maybe, maybe, and this would be maybe the most troubling is that you don't you don't feel like anything would change because you don't care. And in that case, I would seriously challenge you to to reconsider in your life. Do you know really know Jesus as your Savior? Does living a life that pleases him really matter to you? Because God truly does know and see everything that we do, and he sees everything. It should, it, that knowledge should affect us when we get tempted to be upset with a coworker or a boss who just seems really unreasonable. It should make us think twice before same, saying something sarcastic or demeaning to that family member. It should make us want to use our time wisely and not procrastinate, but because you know the Lord is watching. And the fact that, everything, that, that, that God is present and everywhere and knows everything you do should drive you to obey him. But it should also, again, comfort you that whenever the struggles of life seem to besiege you, remember that God's own presence is around you, just like that besieging idea that we talked about earlier. So trust in him and rest in the fact that he is with you. Well, not only is he with us, but he's also strong enough to help us. Truth number three, God is all powerful. This is found in verses 13 through 18, speaking to the omnipotence of God. And verses 13 through 16 talks about how God's power made you. Verse 13 for thou hast possessed my reins, or that's another way of saying, form, formed my inward parts. Thou hast covered 
me in my mother's womb. That's another way of saying thou hast weaved me in my, womb, in my mother's womb. I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knows right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect or unformed, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. So as I said, that this, this is speaking to the fact how God made us. When he says, thou hast possessed my reins, he's meaning that God has formed my inward parts. God has intricately formed you inside and out and has covered or weaved you together in the, your mother's womb. And so God deserves praise for that. It's for such a wonderful and unique way that he has made us. We are made in a revered, admirable way. And David is absolutely convinced of that fact in verse uh, 14. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well, or very well. And then in verse 15, he goes on to talk about how when he was hidden in, in the womb, God still saw him. He's saying, when I was at my weakest and most vulnerable point, and, and, and God saw that I had the capacity to become strong, and God knew me intricately. I like that phrase, curiously wrought, in the middle of verse 15, in the lowest parts of the earth. Now, that's the idea of embroidered, or to color and diversify. You know, working with various colors with a needle, giving the idea, again, of weaving us. God has woven us together with, with tendons and nerves and veins and muscles. And if you uh, uh, listen to the Patch the Pirate CD a long time ago, skin, you know. I'm so glad that I've got skin. Um, we, we just can't understand the structure of it all. But reading this first just gives you a very... Uh, intimate idea of God is as maybe you've seen people uh, crochet or cross stitch or knit or whatever and there's they're sitting here and doing this and, and just just very detailed and God is doing that with all babies and, and it's, it's not just one at a time and you're like oh, okay hold on you know, I got to do this one and this one no he's doing that with with un, you know, so many babies all at one time that he is intimately and intricately forming them and all this was done in the lowest or the hidden parts of the earth. It, it's a, kind of a, 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 a paraphrase, or not a paraphrase, but a, a, just an expression of saying, in his mother's womb, when nobody else could see him. So before David was even complete, he was unperfect, and in the early stages of development, God saw him. And what is more, God knew all of his future before it even happened. God's power planned all this out. And how amazing is that? That God would intimately and intricately form each one of us. And he knew what each one of your lives would turn out to be. Now, as I think of how wonderful uh, it, this is, the, the gift of life and how God has formed each one of us, it just, again, speaks to the fact of how precious life is at every stage. Now, I, well, this past year, was subjected to watching for the first time the, the movie uh, Little Women. Uh, now, in that story, um, the main character, Joe, is an aspiring author and has been writing a story. Spent a lot of time on it, as she has done with other uh, things that she has written. And then her little sister gets mad about something and burns that book in a fire. And, of course, Joe is enraged with all those hours of work she put in have now been wasted. And what right did her sister have to do that? You know, this is the type of thing that happened to me and my siblings when I would have made a Lego set and my, one of my younger siblings would come and, you know, unbeknownst, either unintentionally or intentionally, would come traipsing through and just break it all to pieces. And I'm like, I, I made that up. I didn't have instructions for it. How am I supposed to get it back, you know? Well, how much more important is the life of a child inside the womb whenever God has made this child and someone else takes that life? 
And so obviously I'm speaking to a crowd that's very sympathetic to the pro-life movement and, and would speak against the evils of abortion. But this text is one of the strongest texts for, for the, the sanctity of human life. And so every life at every stage is valuable to God because God is, has made us in his image and we are God's personal creation that he has made. And so therefore, because of that, God is worthy to be praised. Verse 17, he goes on to just, again, David, after all he's been thinking about, he just starts praising God. How precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. God's thoughts are precious. Now what thoughts? His, his knowledge, his presence, his power, what God has revealed to David at this time in life in his revealed word would have been the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. God is, has given that to David that David can cherish. And we, we can read so many other psalms where, where the psalmist says, Oh, how I love thy law, and I will meditate on your law. It's because David cherishes God's thoughts. I remember when Stephanie would write me letters uh, whenever we were uh, just before dating and then after we were dating, you know, I, I, especially the summer that we were apart, uh, she was working at the Wilds, and because she was a counselor at the Wilds, she didn't have her phone, but uh, access to her phone, but for like 30 minutes, for like, uh, you know, um, a, couple a couple days a week, uh, and so I had to wait till the weekends to be able to talk to her. So, you know, we would write each other letters or leave each other a note when we happened to be together on the weekend. And so during the week when I couldn't text her, I would pull out those letters and, and reread them. And I still have them all some, somewhere at home in a file uh, because I cherished those words, those thoughts that she had. And David cherishes God's thoughts. And he goes on further to comment how God's thoughts are of such great number and innumerable. Like the mind of God is so far beyond our ability to comprehend. And then his final comment here in verse 18 in this regard is that God is always present. When I, am, when I awake, I am still with thee. Did your parents ever tell you, whenever you wake up from nap time, grandma and grandpa will be here at that time? Or maybe when you were going on a road trip, we often drove through the night to get to my grandma's house over in Columbus, Ohio, coming from North Carolina. And, and you know, they would say, okay, whenever you guys wake up, we'll, you know, we'll be there at grandma and grandpa's house. Or how about uh, other times whenever I would... Um, you know, I would maybe have a bad dream or something. I would want my mom or dad to just come be with me and sit with me for a while, and I would finally fall asleep. And then a little bit later, I would wake back up, but my mom or my dad was not there anymore because I had fallen asleep, so they had gone to bed or whatever, you know? Well, how comforting that whenever we wake up, God is still there. In other words, he never left us. It's not like, okay, I've got to make sure that I'm back before you wake up, so you think I'm here, but I'm going to go and do this, the, help these people over here, or, you know, go do something fun over here. Or... No, God has never left us. God is still with us, both before, during, and after our times that we sleep. And so what is our response to be towards this? Well, it should be what David's response to God's great power. It's one of praise. We must praise God the Lord. And we don't praise him without knowing him. God, or excuse me, David clearly knew that God, about God, and he had meditate on, meditated on him. He had meditated on his attributes and, and talking about how his, God's thoughts are precious. So we must spend time in God's word and meditate on him so we can better praise him. And so we've seen that because God knows everything, you must worship him. Number two, because God is everywhere, you must trust and obey him. Number three, because God is all-powerful, you must praise him. And then finally, the final truth about God is that he is righteous. And because God is righteous, the response that we must have is that we must pursue him. In verse 19, he goes on to talk about, Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. 
Do I not hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? Am, am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with a perfect hatred and count them mine enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in lead me and lead me in the way everlasting. In verse 19, is it, you think about how is this connecting to God's righteousness. Well, David is expressing trust in God's judgment of the, of the wicked. He's the, saying, surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. David recognizes God's contempt for evil. He recognizes that God is going to judge the wicked. And he's saying, I, I want to, to be on, completely on God's side. God is a righteous God who will judge the wicked. And so we must trust his timing and his justice. And in the meantime, we should have the response that David did in the second half of verse 19, moving into verse 22, to oppose those who oppose God. At the end of verse 19, David says he, has nothing, he wants nothing to do with the wicked, particularly those who shed innocent blood. Uh, Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men, for they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. These types of men that David is referring to are those that speak against God. They blaspheme his name. David opposes these people. And is disassociating himself from them. And then ver moving on, verse 21, he even says, I, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? Now, we know that it would be a contradiction of Scripture to actually hate someone because God says, love your enemies and do good to those that despitefully use you and persecute you. So what, what's going on here? Well, we even think of Mark chapter 3, verse 5, how Jesus had anger and grief because of the people's unbelief. So we must interpret the word here in conjunction with what uh, David says later, am, I, am not I grieved with them that rise up against thee? So the idea of grieved there, David loathes and detests. That's, that's an idea of loathing and detesting something. Um, and so he's loathing and detesting the enemies of God. So again, not so much a personal, literal hatred like we read in Genesis how Esau hated Jacob for stealing his blessing. Because that, that kind of hatred uh, was, was causing Esau to say, at the first opportunity, I'm killing Jacob, okay? That's not the kind of hatred that David is here, has here, is it? Because we've already seen that, is he saying, I'm going to go out and kill these guys myself? No, he says, surely thou wilt slay the wicked. He's leaving justice to God. So it's not that he personally has a hatred for them like Esau hated Jacob. It's more so of a strong disapproval where one takes the same view of sin that God does. David is grieved by their sin, and he's aligning himself with God, with God's side, in opposition to sin by having a perfect or complete or a whole hatred of those who oppose God. He's, he's desiring to have no part of those who blaspheme God, no part with those who oppose God's holy ways. Now again, hate still seems like you know, such a strong word to use here. You know, couldn't he have expressed it some other way? But when you think about it, when one gets a close view of God's holiness and just starts to grasp a small portion of his greatness, one will be so awestruck that he will want to be part of that and shun everything that would shun all sources that attack that holiness. That sound radical? Well, it basically comes down to, I, I, I say this to various people here and there, is that I think, and I struggle with this too, I think we don't have a holy enough view of God. Because if we did, if we had a proper view of God's holiness and how wretched our offensive sin is to him, we would fall on our face and confess our own sin and be resolved to be as, stay as far away from sin as possible and not associate with anyone who tolerates it and revels in sin. 
This is the idea of what Job, it says about Job in chapter 1. He eschewed evil. He, he turned away from it. He, he, he sought to get as far away from it as possible. When you think of Isaiah's response to, to the throne room of God that he sees in Isaiah chapter 6, he says, woe is me. I, he falls. I'm a man of unclean lips amidst a, a, an unclean people. He recognized first his own sinfulness when he saw a glimpse of the heavenly throne room. And that changed him. And if we understood the holiness of God as we ought to, it would change us. And we would seek to stay away from sin as much as possible. And we would, we would want to not associate ourselves with sin. So we would, as we seek to oppose those who oppose God, though, we must do it in humility. Because that's what David did. You know, he just didn't say... I'm so much better than those wicked people out there. You know, I hate them. God, you're going to judge them. That sounds very pharisaical, right? You know, as the Pharisee said, I thank you, God, that I'm so awesome and I tithe of all this great stuff and I'm not like that guy over there. No, that's not what David did. In verse 23, he humbly submits to God's examining and that's what we should do. David realized that he needed his own heart examined. He said, okay, God, I've, I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies, but search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Check, ch try, check my thoughts and check me on whether or not is my hatred of the wicked and sin moving beyond a righteous anger against sin like Jesus displayed, or is it moving towards that hatred uh, that Esau displayed towards Jacob? Is it an unrighteous anger? Check me for any wicked way in me. Any, anything else, God, that you want to point out in my life. He didn't want to be guilty of having a double standard that, that we often have. You know, like, oh, so-and-so wasn't in church day. How dare they? And then the next week, uh, we miss church, and they're like, well, I've, I've got a hangnail. I, I need to stay home, you know? We, we do that oftentimes. We judge people to a higher standard than we hold ourselves. And David's not doing that. He's like, see if there be any wicked way in me. Not so-and-so across the room. Boy, I hope they're listening to this message because they could use it. They really need it. No. See if there be any wicked way in me. And this is the mindset that you know, we as, as pastors <laughs> definitely need. It's like as, as we get up in the pulpit, just confession here, we're not perfect, and so when we get up here, sometimes it's kind of hard because we know we're preaching this message on something that we know that we struggle with, and we, we're like, Lord, I, I need this message more than anybody else in this room, and I'm the one that you want to preach it? And that's a very convicting and humbling thought. So this is something that every one of us needs to focus on whenever we come to, to read God's word for ourselves or into the service. We're not thinking about what anybody else in the room needs to hear. We're thinking about what we need to hear from God's word. This was David's heart. He wanted God to weed out any wickedness in his own heart so that, so that he wouldn't be like the wicked were. And so God's righteousness is so far above our own, it should drive us to pursue him as David did. Pursue God's righteousness. That should be our response to God's righteousness. Well, tonight as I began talking about greatness, I was mentioning how we are in awe of the greatness of various people in their professions, whether it be sports, military, political, or, or business world. And, and we tend to, uh, you know, just display a wowness, you know, respond in a wowness, like, wow, they did that. That was amazing. But even, for instance, in the sports realm, there's a tendency to take for granted the talent and the great plays that people make. You know, the first time somebody averages, or so, the first time a, a, an NBA player gets like 40 to 50 points several nights in a row, we're just like, whoa, that was amazing. Did you see, how, did you see the stat line that he had? That was ridiculous. And then the, the, for the rest of the season, add it all up together, he averages over 30 points. And you're just like, wow, that was amazing. And then after two or three years, he does that a few times. You're like, eh, that was, yeah, he had another 50-point night. Big deal. Whatever. Oh, yeah, he, you know, you know, Patrick Mahomes threw another big sidearm, you know, across his body, all across the field. Eh, we've seen it before. 
And we even get complacent with our own athletes and we're like, just kind of sit there and yawn and be like, mm, yeah, show me something else that I haven't seen before. And we get complacent even with, with the, the greatness that we see or hear on earth, but how much more on a serious level do we get complacent with the greatness of God? And, and we don't take seriously and respond as we ought to to God's greatness. So in review, we've seen we see that God is, we've seen that he is omniscient and omnipotent, and he's, he is omnipresent and he's righteous, and that invokes a response from us that should, that we should respond in worship, we should trust and obey, and we should praise, and then finally, pursue him. And we don't do any of these things without truly knowing God. So how well do you know God? Are you committed to pursuing him or to submitting to him? And do you really want to have change in your life? Is 2021 a year where, you, where you're thinking, I want to be closer to God than I've ever been before by the end of this year? Or as you look back in 2020 and think, you know, I don't know if I really changed that much. I, I just kind of plateaued. We should be desiring to move, to grow closer to the Lord and, and to change, be more and more like him. And the more you, you desire to be like him, the more he will show you what you need to change. And you will not want anything to do with this world. And so may the Lord give us grace that we all need to make 2021 a year of worshiping, trusting, obeying, praising, and pursuing God.